Hello and welcome to my friend the Rainbow Circle. Um, attempt number two to record this while waiting on my son to get out of school. Um, so I might have to pause this and finish this later. I just got a call from uh, someone telling my, me my social security number was being used and the, and the robocall used really bad grammar. So I was thinking... Why don't they have a grammar check on these on these uh, scams? I have no idea. Um, but anyway, it was from the Social Security office, and they were using really bad grammar. Um, but anyway, so I just went to. I guess I can, I can laugh. Um, I just uh, set up an appointment for counseling with the Cumbie Center for to assist uh, abused people. I think is what it, the the place is called um, to get some counseling. Um, for my 13 years of being a recipient of physical abuse uh, in in my marriage, and uh, as a as an artist or artiste, um, as I prefer to call myself, um, it's not funny. I don't know why I'm laughing. Um, I do have my art just packed in here. Um, I had a whole art thing over the weekend, and I still have all my art stuff. I have my Boyd's, my Boyd monsters dangling from my rearview mirror. Um, but uh, as an artist, fiction writer, here's a picture of me that I collaged. It's egotistical, right? Um, but as an artist, the whole idea of getting counseling for some sort of miserable, traumatic experience uh, sort of triggers this idea. I mean, it's kind of an automatic idea. Um, you know, an association with being an artist, I think, or an artiste. Um, that there's a potential that if you get uh, counseling for any sort of misery or trauma or what have you, that might undermine your ability to do art. Um, you know, the there's a certain manic depression that's just intrinsic to art. So if you cure manic depression, are you going to cure your ability to do art? You know, there's a, there's a long, long standing association between the two. And so that's sort of an automatic response. Um, you know, a worry that if I do get cured from my trauma, will it go too far? Um, and I, my brother over Thanksgiving, he saw that I was miserable because of course I am. Um, full, full disclosure, me laughing right now is not based on actual happiness, but, uh, he said, at least it'll be good for your art. Uh, and, um, you know, it's well-intentioned. It's sort of a linear perspective. I'm about to refute just logically why that's uh, an inaccurate perspective. Um, but it also relates to, uh, I've been watching Elizabeth Gil Gilbert Ted talks, um, lately. And the reason for this I'm not normally Elizabeth Gilbert fan, not because I dislike her or anything. I just never really got into her work and never really read her stuff. Um, but it comes from watching uh, Taylor Swift's uh, Tiny Desk Tiny Desk concert, um, where she talks about how she likes to watch this Elizabeth Gilbert TED Talk and cry. She enjoys crying to this Elizabeth Gilbert TED Talk. Um, so I said, I, I'll have to check that out. So, you know, my, me not reading Elizabeth Gilbert, that's not a, an, you know, I just called myself an artiste, of course. I'm very, very sophisticated artiste. Um, but not reading Elizabeth Gilbert it has nothing to do with, you know, feeling superior to her, her, uh, you know, mood or whatever. Fully confess, huge Taylor Swift fan. Um, Taylor Swift speaks to me. <laughs> maybe I should start reading Elizabeth Gilbert. I don't know. Maybe that's who, who I'm going to become now. Who knows? Um, <laughs> let me get back on track. Um, but she uh, said she liked to cry to this Elizabeth Gilbert uh, TED Talk before she sang her song Lover. And full disclosure, that song makes me cry. And I enjoy it for that reason. Um, but the reason... I mean, there, there's a whole complicated reason why, but... Um, and I think of the reason I enjoy Taylor Swift's music, par partially. It's irrational, it doesn't need a reason, of course, that this is what I talk about on many, many episodes of My Friend the Rainbow Circle. Um, but part of the reason is because, uh, a song like Lover, it's clearly 
to me just a made up ideal. You know, she has a whole series of songs that are kind of this made up ideal of what romance is supposed to be. And then she'll counterpoint that with a more tragic sort of breakup story. She has that whole cycle of those. Um, there's that manic depression for you. Um, so, uh, the Elizabeth Gilbert TED Talk, this is my main point, actually. Um, the fact that Taylor Swift likes to watch this and cry, and I like to listen to Lover and Cry. I have no shame. I do that. Um, uh, but Elizabeth Gilbert, I get she has a couple of TED Talks, but I'm guessing it's this one about, um, the, uh, how artists have this association of misery and, um, and being able to do art, um, that if we able, are able to take care of ourselves psychologically, we might lose our ability to, to make art. Um, and, you know, she, and she talks about the genius in the sense of the spirit that's outside of us. Um, there are, the first time I listened to this TED Talk, I, I thought I disagreed with it, but then I listened to it again, and I think I might agree with it. That's complicated, right? Um, that's manic depression, I guess. Um, but what I disagree with is the notion that there is a necessity to of the artist to take care of people and heal them. Like healing, I, I would say, it's not really a goal of art. The goal is to help people continue to feel really bad. <laughs> But I think the misconception there, um, and I think this is a misconception at the root of the notion that we can feel better about feeling bad by knowing that we can channel it into art, or that channeling something into art is a way of making us feel better. This is one of the questions I heard from the Cumbie Center. Do you, do you do anything to, you know, feel better? I mentioned creativity. I don't think that makes me feel better, or if that's even a goal. Or, 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 honestly, I don't think that's a goal of art. Um, because, you know, just looking at the notion that Taylor Swift watches this TED Talk in order to cry, and she enjoys crying. Um, I think the misconception is that... Uh, is that... Um, bad feelings are bad, necessarily. I think that's a misconception that negative emotions are universally negative and problems to be solved. I think that is a big problem. Um, from a perspective of the art itself, so listening to a sad song, I'm listening to it not to feel less sad, but to feel more sad, to feel something, to l eliminate the numbness of existence by feeling something. Um, and so if you think about the rainbow circle, I don't have the rainbow circle with me, um, but the rainbow circle, the core value of art is the intensity of emotion. It's not negative or positive emotion. So the goal is not, you know, just this dualistic notion of feeling good, um, but the intensity of feeling more so than anything else. And I would separate that from, you know, here's the, here's the key. And I think this is kind of actually what, Elizabeth Gilbert was getting at the first time I read it, I uh, I interpreted her to mean that we need to heal, um, and that's the goal of the artist is to heal. I don't think that's what she was saying necessarily. She was worried about artists who were self destructive, and you know my perspective was that's just par for the course. I mean that's ultimately irrelevant. I always go back to uh, Andre Breton. Um, since I'm an artiste and I'm very sophisticated, I say uh, André Breton. Um, but he said, you know, the ultimate surreal act is shooting someone ran at random. Um, I would separate that. That is an artistic act, but I would separate that from the moral implications of causing physical harm in the real world. I would never, ever advocate anyone harming another or anyone, you know, I'm extremely pacifistic. I love uh, violent stories. Horror stories are some of my favorite stories. Um, but I would never, ever, ever, just in my real life advocacy of what is right and wrong beyond just the artistic act, I would never, ever, ever advocate hurting anyone. But 
that sort of randomness and danger and fear and what have you, um, as an artistic act, the intensity of that feeling um, is the most surreal act. It's a complicated sort of a paradox um, that I'm always fascinated by. Um, so our, our art being self-destructive um, and artists, you know, becoming alcoholics and suicidal and that sort of thing. I would say that's part of the course. It's, it's horrible. I wouldn't want anyone to experience that, of course. But arguably, there is a separation from the real harm that you can do yourself and your ability to feel intense feelings. Um, and I think that's actually what Elizabeth Gilbert was talking about. And in the rainbow circle, the core is the intensity of the feeling. Um, the goal of the artist is to optimize the intensity of the feeling, recognizing our defensive mechanisms that we, re we resist the intensity of feeling. Um, five levels of, of subordination away from that is reality. I don't think we have any sort of obligation to reality necessarily. So I don't. that's why I would say art is not there to heal people it's not there to eliminate feelings i mean that's actually the opposite arguably um uh but i would say in order to i mean i think this is what she was ultimately saying my interpretation at least and ult ultimately to deal with the intensity of feeling without harming the five levels of subordination away from this core without harming the reality you can recognize the ability to separate the two. And I would use Taylor Swift as a great example of this. Um, and, you know, commonly when it comes to mashing together artistic suffering and real life suffering, um, uh, people conflate the two and make them a necessary component of one another. But if you look at Taylor Swift's life, I mean, this is sort of inspired by, she had a song that just came out called Christmas Tree Farm. She grew up on this beautiful Christmas tree farm. And in the video, it shows all these images of how she grew up. And her parents were rich before the Christmas tree farm. I used to think that, you know, they were just sort of humble farmers. No, they were. They, her father was an investment banker, I think. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's just a fun, beautiful upbringing on this Christmas tree farm in Pennsylvania where they had snow. She started out as a country artist, but she didn't grow up in the South, so she had snow. Um, uh, and she became successful very, very young. Um, and so, I mean, on one level, you would say, I mean, this is this is an unfortunate thing that that people do to people who actually genuinely suffer. They will say, look at your reality what about your reality justifies your suffering? And that's entirely an, an inaccurate way of looking at suffering. Suffering doesn't necessarily have to have any sort of relationship with reality. You can have somebody with a perfect life and they can be miserable. And you can't, you can't dismiss their misery by saying, look at your perfect life. Um, and Taylor Swift uh, talks about how she worries about you know, getting happy. What what in her life does she have that is possibly not making her happy? I mean, on one level, if you look at it that way, um, she has all of these things that are just dreams for any sort of artist to have. Adoration of fans, the ability to do whatever she wants to do artistically, huge amount of money. Um, you know, what about her reality could possibly make her miserable? Um, you know, her failed relationships. Um, but that's why I would say probably the best way, I mean, arguably, um, the best way to really read her discussions of relationships is more of the um, imagined uh, misery. Not imagined in that she doesn't feel the misery, but imagined in the sense that she, it doesn't necessarily have to correlate. You know, she goes through a breakup and she is able to mine that for feelings, but she doesn't necessarily have to have a breakup in order to access the feelings. So 
Um, and I think this is kind of a roundabout way of getting at, I think, what Elizabeth Gilbert is talking about, filtering it through the concept of the rainbow circle. The key is the, the feelings themselves and the feelings. Um, and also, here's just a side rant. Um, maybe running out of time. But as a side rant, I think probably uh, one of the most fascinating bits of uh, hypocritical dynamics in judgment about how art works is the way in which people entirely dismiss the taste of teenage girls. Teenage girls, if they like something, it must automatically be bad. And that's that's true with Taylor Swift, and she sort of crossed over into other fandoms over time. Um because she's a great songwriter and anyone who entirely subjectively enjoys her work is entirely valid in enjoying her work. Um, but we have this tendency in our culture to say, this must be bad because teenage girls like it. But why are we dismissing the entirely valid subjective opinion of teenage girls? Um, and, you know, you can... You hear lots of excuses for that. They haven't experienced anything. There's no real valid reason for them feeling things. So if they enjoy this miserable song, you say, you know, what, what, if, they, what have they really experienced in their comfortable lives? Um, in their very privileged experience, have they really suffered? Um, probably not, but I would say, you know, arguably. <laughs> but I would say... Uh, they still have, whether or not you've actually suffered biographically, that there's no necessary relationship between that and your ability to feel valid, strong feelings. And I would say that's a mistake in our treatment of people um, and our dismissal of their feelings, our ability to feel empathy for others. If you see someone who has a great life, but they're actually miserable, um, will you dismiss them because biographically they have no real logical justification for their suffering? But their suffering may be entirely valid. Um, so just as an artist, I use really miserable traumatic experiences. I mine them for intense feelings. Um, but just because those particular intense feelings go away doesn't mean that I'll have nothing to mind from <laughs> because the biographical trauma is, really only has incidental relationship with the actual ability to channel and tap into intense feelings. Um, uh, the intense feelings are the, really the prime thing to mind from. Um, the biographical part of it is really just secondary um, and incidental. It's valid. It's, you know, I support anyone who um, has those biographical traumas. But if you even if you don't, you still have entirely valid reasons for feeling what you feel. But we, we tend to just dismiss people's feelings for um, this false association between, you know, this false, this false universal. This is my my bugbear for you know so many different episodes false universals this false universal association uh between you know biographical mis misery and um artistic uh misery um and that's kind of elizabeth gilbert's idea is that uh the genius or the the daemon or whatever you want to call it this is something that goes through an artist it's not necessarily something that's directly correlated with biographical experience um but anyway <laughs> uh now that we've had this downer of an episode maybe i'll come up with something happy to talk about on the next episode probably not but we'll see <laughs> see you in the next episode